Good morning, and thank you all for joining us for today's business support series, episode 28. Uh, I'm uh, Mike Neal, President and CEO of the Tulsa Regional Chamber. Uh, the Chamber's business support series offers insights into how your organization can effectively respond to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and subsequently the recovery. Uh, if there's an area where the Chamber can be of assistance to you or your company, please let us know. Uh, all of you are familiar with the phrase, cash is king, and our speakers today will discuss how to safeguard, safeguard cash flow uh, during this pandemic. We're also pleased uh, to have with us Oklahoma Secretary of Commerce and Workforce Development, Sean Copeland, for an update on the resources available to small businesses. But, with, but before we discuss the topic in more detail with our esteemed speakers, I'd like to thank the sponsors of our business support series. You see them listed at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Luxa Enterprises and Security Bank. And speaking of Security Bank, we're pleased to have with us uh, Eric Boney, Chairman and CEO of Security Bank. And I'll pass it over to Eric to introduce today's speakers. Eric? Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a privilege uh, for me to uh, welcome uh, Wally Bryce. Uh, Wally is the business development leader for Gallagher, a global insurance risk management and consulting firm. Wally joined the company in 1995 as a merger merged partner. Since joining Gallagher, he has held several roles, including branch manager, niche manager director, and executive director of Gallagher's e-business initiatives. Today, he is responsible for business development for Gallagher Global Brokerage. We also have uh, Jeff Hatfield, he is the uh, U.S. enterprise sales leader for Gallagher, driving organic growth through the development and implementation of sales science. Jeff has spent 18 plus years working in the insurance industry and joined Gallagher in 2017 as a regional sales leader. In his current role, he helps lead Gallagher new business growth strategies within the Great Lakes, Midwest, and South Central regions. Uh, we also have uh, Sean Copeland, uh, who is Oklahoma Secretary of Commerce and Workforce Development and the Chairman and CEO of Regent Bank. In his role on Governor Stitt's cabinet, Sean oversees 36 states agencies that lead the economic development and community development and workforce development efforts for the state of Oklahoma. Under his leadership, the state has attracted more than 65 new businesses since 2019, uh, Governor Stitt has now tasked Secretary Copeland with leading our business and economic development recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I would like to thank you all uh, for joining us today. Uh, and we will uh, start with uh, Wally, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, Eric, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for everybody that's on the call today. I, um, I'm joined with Jeff Hatfield. The only thing on the Eric I'd add is uh, I'm a proud alum of Oklahoma State University, at, which I also call the Princeton on the Prairie. Mike should be laughing at that right now. So today uh, we wanted to, Jeff and I wanted to actually, uh, I was going to advance the slides, but I, you can, oh, there we go. Uh, Jeff and I are going to talk about protecting the balance sheet in kind of an interesting way. We, we're both in the insurance business, and typically people think about protecting the balance sheet uh, as from tornadoes and uh, fires and such and liability claims, but we really want to talk about liquidity and revenue and expense management and because uh, it's what's on the minds of our CFOs today. So I'm going to uh, think, of, uh oh, I need to go back to that one page. Can somebody, Morgan, can you, yeah, click back to that next? Yeah, there you go. So, uh, like I said, uh, Jeff and I think a lot of CFOs sees insurance one way. This is kind of that optical illusion. Is this two faces or is it a vase? Well, no matter how you think about it today, maybe by the end of the day, we'll have you thinking about it maybe just slightly differently than you've ever thought about it before. And uh, just a little Gallagher infomercial. We, 
we always talk about uh, the total cost of risk, but we have a proprietary way that we uh, deal with risk and minimize revenue and max and I mean maximize revenue and minimize expenses. We call that Core 360. So just a little chart about how we think about this, which drives this next discussion. It's about cash is king and liquidity and revenue. Like I said, about what's on the mind of CFOs today. So let me just talk about liquidity on the balance sheet. It's obviously on everybody's mind, especially with the COVID crisis. And let me just turn it over to Jeff for just a few ideas about how we can, how you can drive an innovative way to think about liquidity on your balance sheet. So Jeff, do you, do you have some thoughts on that? Hey, thanks Wally, I sure do. Uh, great to be with everyone. So. You know, during these unprecedented times, it's important to think about things differently. And, and when it comes to liquidity, you know, in particular to your insurance expenses, think about the exposure that you used in renewing your insurance policies. And what I mean by that is your sales, your uh, autos, your payroll. Well, the, the reality is a, a lot of companies out there and, and a lot of companies out there over um, estimated what that is going to be because you know we couldn't have uh, predicted what what COVID would bring. So don't wait until after your policy is over um, expires to ask for an audit. Um, even if your policies are not auditable, if you know your business is being impacted 30, 40, 50 percent, work with your broker to make sure that you're going back to the insurance company to say, look, you collected premiums expecting full um, you know, exposure would be present over the term. The reality, that isn't occurring and I need an adjustment. Another idea, if you're paying your premiums up front, look at leveraging the, the asset, which is your, your insurance policy as collateral and financing that premium over 12 months. So, so what these banks will do they'll give you very attractive terms, two, 3%, maybe a little more, maybe a little less based on your financial strength of your company. But, you know, while cash is king, paying that, you know, 100% of your premium up front is uh, just not a good use of capital in this environment if you're able to use your policies as collateral and get terms of two, 3%. Um, I'm sure you, you likely have debt existing outside of your insurance for higher higher amounts um, think about premium holidays so you know at gallagher we're working with our our carrier partners to say right now you talk about being a partner to our clients and your clients show it if if you're already on you know a, a 10 month schedule where you have monthly payments well what if you could push the next two month payments to the very end when business will knock on wood be healthy again and um these carriers are stepping up. So, you know, a great opportunity there. Um, you know, and then the last thing under liquidity, Wally, I think I'd add is think about how your exposure has changed. Um, you know, if you have a lot of employees working from home, um, you may have reported that payroll as a manufacturing risk. Well, if a lot of these employees are, are still being paid, but they're not in that environment, make sure you're, you're communicating with your carriers to, to um, uh, you know, offer adjustments. And that, that should be a nice infusion of cash, i.e. Uh, improving liquidity. So uh, that, that, that's very interesting, Scott. Uh, can we go back one slide, Morgan? I think I must have, there you go, the revenue strategies. Now, you talk about something that you may not have heard about. When we think about revenue strategies and through our lens in the insurance industry, Jeff, we've got some innovative ways to think about how we grow the top line through this pandemic as well, right? Tell me about That's that. A good yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, a lot of the liquidity is really blocking and tackling, you know, pure execution, right? When it comes to growing revenue, 
that's when you really need strategy, um, a strategic broker. And, you know, think about your supplier terms or your customer terms as, as a CFO, CEO on the call. You know, are you asking for payment up front? Um, you know, because you don't want to extend that credit risk. There's a whole area of insurance called uh, trade credit insurance that can help you really insulate your bad debt, your accounts receivable, your allowance for doubtful accounts, where you can, you know, begin offering new terms because your, your customers are likely um, in difficult times right now. So what if you could offer them, you know, the, the, the product service up front, but not have to be paid for 30, 60, net 90 uh, day terms? Well, you don't want to take that risk on uh, bear. You can put in place a trade credit insurance policy that can get you the best of both worlds, and it can be a competitive advantage for you to grow your revenue. Yeah, Jeff, we've seen clients now that are trading in foreign markets that are nervous about that counterparty risk, and the trade credit is a global footprint, correct? It is. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great point. There's, there's whole uh, different a avenues around trade disruption insurance that, you know, if you have product that can't get out of a port for any various reason, to, you can, you can insure that. So um, a lot of deeper conversation to be had there for sure. Wally. Right. Yeah. And we, we've also had clients where they weren't buying any, most Clients don't even know that accounts receivable can be insured. You got to think about that one for a second. It's probably the biggest item on the balance sheet that's not insured, but you can insure it and uh, actually grow your business by virtue of having it insured and maybe even get better terms and conditions with your on your bank line. So now it's kind of shifting over from revenue strategies to uh, expense reduction strategies. Jeff, let's let's have a conversation about that. What do we do? What can we do there that's collaborative and innovative? Yeah. Um, so two two points I think uh, are worth mentioning here. And one is what we what we like to refer to as risk optimization. If you're a company that has just taken what's called a guaranteed cost insurance program uh, structure over years past, where you pay the premium and the insurance carrier pays 100% of any claim. In this environment, more than ever, um, it, it's important to take a critical lens, a critical view of that. And don't let the markets drive your premium. Um, you know, hire an actuary, conduct the work uh, up front to say, what is the volatility of my loss expectancy? And you can do that on a property side. You can do that on your casualties, so your general liability, product liability, workers' compensation. But really understand what the risk-reward trade-off is because taking some risk while it can be uncomfortable can really be a better solution for you um, if done uh, you know, through some science and, and the right way. And the other is really straightforward, but now more than ever um, is, is important. So it's submission quality. So when you think about, um, you know, how you've presented your risk into the marketplace, you know, as an organization, how are you selling that risk into the, into the marketplace? So when you go to a AIG or a Liberty or Travelers to get insurance, how are you presenting yourself? Submission quality, really going back and making sure, do I have un, unaddressed property recommendations that, uh, you know, I haven't looked at? going to have to pay a big premium if you haven't uh, addressed that. Can you present that risk in a better light? You will drive better results, lower your expenses, and i.e. improve liquidity. Yeah. And just lastly, real quickly, uh, talk, talk to me about some balance sheet strategies that are, our audience may not be aware of. Yeah. Um, this, this, you know, is, is one of our favorites. We love to look at unencumbered assets on your balance sheet. Uh, I'm sorry, my, uh, had a break in my, my, uh, technology here. Can you hear me, Wally? Yeah. Okay. So we love to look at unencumbered assets on the balance sheet and, and one is intellectual property. So do you have patents? <clears throat> copyrights, trademarks, um, 
And, you know, maybe you're in the need of a loan, but that, that bank is uh, charging you a, an exorbitant amount for, that, for those funds. Well, what if you could um, use your intellectual property, that unencumbered asset, as security for the loan? There's insurance products out there that exist that you could buy the insurance to make the bank whole, um, and it can significantly re reduce your borrowing costs. Um, and there's many more, but in the interest of time, we think those are hopefully some strategies that can, can be put to use right yeah. away. Yeah, very, very interesting on the intellectual property uh, issue. So I think, I, I think, I hope we, we've given you some ideas that maybe you see the vase and the two faces at the same time. So uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Mike, uh, or to you, Eric. Well, thank, thank you, gentlemen, both. And let's go to uh, Sean Copeland now. Sean, it's a cute background you have there. Uh, uh, hey, Mike. I, uh, I thought I would uh, talk to you in front of me. That would be fine uh, to, to uh, share. Sean, we're having a little reception. Uh, you were coming in for a minute with a little challenge there. Okay, you can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I, okay, sorry about that, guys. Yeah, I'm actually on the road today, so I'm doing a little bit of uh, multitasking uh, to uh, uh, fulfill my obligation here, and we're actually meeting with a, a company today that we're trying to uh, persuade, persuade to move to Oklahoma. So, uh, exciting day. So let me jump in. What I'm going to talk about uh, to you guys today uh, is what kind of programs are available both federally as well as through the state of Oklahoma. And so I'll just hit these real quick and then I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. So let's start off with the state program, the Oklahoma Business Relief Program. So this is a, this is a program, it's a grant program offered through the Department of Commerce. Uh, it is up to $25,000. It's two months of your payroll. And the key is that it is needs based. And so the company must uh, be have revenues that are down 25% from pre COVID to post COVID. And that basically means you can and, and all the rules are available at the Oklahoma Commerce uh, website, which I'll give you in just a moment. But basically, uh, you can choose one of three different time frames, compare it back to those are your pre COVID numbers, compare it to post-COVID, and as long as you're down 25% and you qualify as a small business, uh, you do qualify for this uh, program. It's, it's operated through financial institutions like uh, Mr. Boney, uh, who is online here with us today. And so basically what you'll do is to, to determine whether or not your bank or credit union is participating, go to okcommerce.gov forward slash relief. We've got a list of all of the financial institutions that are participating. You'll go onto the Commerce website, download the application, fill it out, up, uh, basically um, deliver it along with a little bit of supporting financial documentation to the bank, and then they will submit it on your behalf. We've got phase one went very, very quickly on June the 29th. All the money basically uh, was spoken for within one day. We think phase two will probably go pretty quickly as well. And uh, that will be on Tuesday, uh, July the 14th, which is next Tuesday. So you'll want to be ready uh, for that. So that's the that's Oklahoma Business Relief Program. That's a grant. You get that money. It's 25,000 bucks. You can use it for any operating expense within your company. There's no clawback provision. There is no uh, way that you have to use it. It's very, very flexible and, and the dollars are yours. Uh, we also have the Paycheck Protection Program that has now been extended to August the 8th. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the PPP program, but it's also, uh, it's, it's two and a half months of uh, payroll. Um, it has to be used now 60-40, 60% must be used for payroll, 40% can be used for other uh, purposes. And um, 
um, as long as you use it for those purposes, the money, the dollars will be forgiven. Uh, so you do not have to pay it back. If you do not use it, you will have to pay it back over a five-year period. Uh, the interest rate is 1%. Uh, and so it's been a fantastic program. There's still $130 billion available in PPP funds. It's really remarkable. Um, and there, I know there are still a number of businesses that have not taken advantage of it yet because June 30 was the prior a deadline, and I don't know about Eric, but I'm in the banking business too, and we had a bunch of applications on June the 30th, and there's no way to get them all done that day, and so thankfully it has been um, extended uh, to August the 8th. The other nice part about the PPP program is it's been extended from uh, an eight-week program to a 24-week program, so you have longer uh, to use the money, you have longer to request forgiveness, it just has a lot more uh, flexibility. You know, another thing that has not been as widely reported, uh, but, but is also back, is the SBA IDLE program, E-I-D-L uh, program. This is a long-term line of credit program through the SBA. Uh, you, for, for it, uh, you actually go through sba.gov. Uh, for both the PPP program and the Oklahoma Business Relief program, you work for, through a local financial institution. But for the IDLE program, you can get a $10,000 upfront advance and you can get up to $150,000 line of credit or it's $1,000 per employee up to $150,000. And, um, and this one is a, it's a 30 year uh, credit line. It has a very low interest rate, 3.75%, uh, I believe. And so uh, very uh, flexible um, and easy to use. So, you know, in addition to that, I wholeheartedly agree with what the gentleman said earlier. I would really uh, work with your financial institution. All of us have been given a mandate by our regulator that we need to work with clients through this COVID-19 uh, crisis that we are all in. And so you're gonna see flexibility through your bank and credit union that you have probably not seen in the past. And that is because we've all been given the green light uh, to do so and to help our clients. And so you may be amazed, a lot of them are offering interest only, uh, you know, uh, uh, no payments for a period of time just to help you get through this time. We know it's not your fault. Um, none of us did anything to uh, deserve this, and it's just a crisis that we have to get through together. So, um, I, you know, the only other thing that I might mention real quick, uh, guys, before I go is the uh, Main Street program. And this, this program is, it's a little different. This is a traditional banking program where, uh, the, the bank might be able to be a little bit more flexible on a loan to you because they are able to sell 95% of the loan off to uh, the Federal Reserve. And so the bank only keeps 5%, so they have a very low risk. And so this may be, uh, we actually just did one of these yesterday, and it may be a way that you, you can get funding where otherwise you not might not be able to the the minimum loan amounts 250 it goes up to 25 million it is a five year loan program so you have to be able to pay it off within five years the first year the interest is capitalized so there's no payment the second year you pay interest only and then you actually have to pay it back the final three years so it gets a little bit challenging to make the underwriting work uh, but it can work for the right companies and it is a way to get additional capital uh, to those companies. So guys, those are the programs that I am aware of. I know there are some local programs, Mike, that you're probably familiar with at the city and the county level, but uh, I'll let you speak on those. Um, and so that's all I would have to share today. That was great, Sean. Thank you so very much. Uh, I'll tell our speakers, we may go five minutes long today, guys. So we'll, uh, we'll try to, I'm just going to maybe do a, a quick question for Wally and Jeff, and then let uh, Eric go with one to Sean. And that really is my first one, say, for, for, the, uh, for the dynamic duo of Wally and Jeff, that small businesses are often hit hardest by crises such as this, um, as Sean was just describing. But what do you see as the biggest mistake that small businesses make uh, when it comes to balance sheet strategies? And what should these businesses do instead? 
Wally, if you can unmute yourself. You and Jeff can both unmute. How's, how's that? Am I back there yeah, live? Good. Jeff, if you can unmute. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll also hand it to Jeff in just a second, but just, just a, a quick thought is uh, like, like Sean was mentioning, the, the financial institutions, and I'll put insurance companies in that same group, you know, they're, they are under the microscope to do something for their clients. And if you need help, like restructuring the payment program, you, to, you know, there's been a lot of lit litigation in California about whether or not there should even be insurance collected during the pandemic, uh, a lot of noise and all of that. But reach out to your broker and say, look, I've got some challenges around protecting my balance sheet in a non-traditional way. So tell me what tell me what I can do that I'm missing that you're doing for your other clients. Yeah. Can you hear me okay, Wally? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is Jeff and uh, you know, and to echo Wally's comment comments is as a small business owner, um, you know, you may not have the leverage that uh, you know you would like to get some things done in the marketplace. So, you know, a, a firm like Gallagher, we work with you know the largest companies in the world and the smallest companies in the world. But from that, it's important because we see what these companies will do for some of the large firms. And what we'd love to do is bring that flexibility down into that small uh, and medium business. So. You know, by partnering with a smaller firm yourself, you may not uh, just you may not be getting the type of leverage you need. So I think there's opportunity to, um, while you may be a small organization, partner with a large organization who may have a, a broader lens into what is available out there. That was good. Thank you, thank you, Wally and Jeff. I got a quick one for Sean. Then we'll go to uh, Eric for the final question. And Sean, you talked. In your comments, you talked about next Tuesday being the kickoff for phase two of the Oklahoma Business Relief Program. Uh, what advice would you have for small businesses today uh, that they should be doing, Sean, in preparation for next Tuesday? Yeah, Eric can answer this just as well as I can, but I would say they need to uh, get their get their documents um, into their financial institution quick. Uh, and you basically need to uh, lean on that financial institution to make sure they are on the ball and get your application uploaded to commerce. The, the link becomes live at 8 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. And so you got to just find somebody that will uh, commit to put you at the top of the stack and get you uh, uh, uploaded early because I bet I bet it'll only last four or five hours uh, on Tuesday. I do think, uh, Mike, that there will be additional uh, phases to this at the state level. These have gone so well. The execution has, has been great and our banks have been so great to work with. So I think we will have another phase or two uh, of these. We might tweak it just a little bit to include some other businesses that this doesn't fit quite as well, uh, but I don't think this is the last one either. Great, thank you, Sean. With just five minutes so, remaining, I'll now toss to Eric for our final question. Eric? Okay, um, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, Sean, I really appreciate uh, your comments and I appreciate you uh, working uh, so well in the uh, Tulsa banking community. We've known each other for so many years. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about Tels uh, Tesla. Uh, can you share with us any, up any updates? Uh, Re yeah, if they threw this question. I'm sorry, Sean, uh, regarding your meeting with Elon Musk last week. Uh, sure. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. We actually had some good conversations with them uh, early this morning. So, so the chamber, the city of Tulsa and the state um, and the county all worked very, very hard on this uh, opportunity. And um, as you see behind me, this was the a picture of our uh, meeting out at the site uh, last Friday. Uh, it was a little over an hour and just kind of uh, condensing it down. You know, we, we really made about 12 different points as to why we are confident that Tulsa uh, is their best choice. Um, it's pretty obvious. Um, to us, and I think to many members of the team, that, that this is where they should go. Um, I will tell you, uh, Elon's major uh, 
two issues are, can we recruit the high-end engineering talent uh, to Tulsa, the best of the best? Will they come live in Tulsa? We believe they can, and we've actually got some uh, strategies that we are implementing to prove that uh, point. Uh, and then he wants to get his executive team comfortable, but he, he was very complimentary. He said that he had never seen and he said we were a 10 in terms of support and that he had never seen a community rally around a company like we have done around Tesla. He was very familiar with everything that we have done and very, very complimentary. So I feel good about it. I think we will know uh, within the next couple of weeks. They are very familiar with Austin. Uh, they have some business down there already. So part of the challenge has been getting them comfortable with us, you know, getting them comfortable with Tulsa. But if you think about the fact that, I mean, they started out with probably a hundred cities on this deal and man, top, top shelf cities all over the country. And the fact that we are all down to two um, is super exciting. And, you know, I think we have a very, very good chance of bringing this home. John, thank you. For, thank you for those words. And thank you for the exceptional job of leadership that, uh, Governor Stitt and you have provided, uh, been a great partnership with the mayor, George Kaiser Family Foundation and others, but the leadership that the Governor Stitt and you have provided, Sean, have been extraordinary. And so we are, uh, all of us are cheering you on and working behind the scenes to support you any way we can. And we, we thank you, uh, we, we thank you for the I great job you guys are doing. We appreciate Thanks, it. Um, so let me again thank uh, Wally, Jeff and Sean, along with Eric for joining us today. Again, I want to thank our sponsors listed at the bottom of the screen, Luxa Enterprises and Security Bank for their ongoing generous support of this series. To anyone who came in late, called in by phone, or would like to share a copy of this webinar, a recording will be posted on the Chamber's website later this afternoon. Uh, before we close, I want to let you know about an upcoming signature event on Tuesday, August the 4th. We'll host our annual State of the State uh, featuring Sean's boss and good friend, Governor Kevin Stitt. Uh, this year's event will take place virtually and the live stream will be free to watch. You can register for the State of the State and all upcoming events on TulsaChamber.com slash events. Please note that advanced registration is required uh, for all Chamber events. Last year, that event drew 12 to 1300 individuals at the Cox Business Center. And unfortunately, as the uh, cases have been peaking, uh, we've had to back off the the live event, but the governor is excited about participating virtually with us. If you found today's event valuable and would like to help us ensure we can continue to bring additional informative uh, programs like this, please consider making a donation to support our mission. The donation form is available at TulsaChamber.com slash support our mission. Again, thank you again to our fabulous speakers today and our hosts, we appreciate you. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to the chamber staff or to me personally, if we can be of assistance to you or your business in any form or fashion as you continue your recovery process uh, throughout this lengthy pandemic. So thank you for joining us today and have a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you all.